was actually on Broadway for 10 years before I found this practice, and my last Broadway show was a chorus line, and I was understudying three of the lead roles, which basically means you show up to the theater and you have no idea who you're going on for. Sometimes I would start the show as one character, and then halfway through they would switch me to a different character, or I'd just be chilling in my dressing room doing my taxes, and someone would say, Emily Fletcher, we need you on stage! And I would start panicking because I wouldn't know which character I was playing, so I would just grab three costumes, run down seven flights of stairs, someone would throw me in an outfit, and I'm not kidding, sometimes I would be on stage before I knew which character I was going to play. So I was basically living my life in this constant state of anxiety, and even though I was living my dream, even though I was doing the thing that I had wanted to do since I was six, I was miserable. I started going gray at the tender age of 27. I started having insomnia for 18 months. I couldn't sleep through the night. I started getting sick and injured, and it was very confusing to me why I was living my dream and miserable. There was a moment where I was like listening to Eckhart Tolle, rocking myself in fetal position underneath my <laughs> dressing room table. And so thankfully, this amazing woman was sitting next to me in the dressing room. She was understudying five of the lead roles, which is incredibly challenging, but this woman was nailing it. I mean, every bite of food she ate was a celebration. Every dance she danced was a celebration. Every song she sang was a celebration. And I was like, I need to have some of what she's having. <laughs> and I said, lady, what do you know that I don't know? And she said, I meditate. And I was like, come on, because this is 10 years ago. Because no one was talking about it, and no one had outed themselves. There wasn't as much neuroscience back then. And so I didn't really believe her, so I just kept going gray and having insomnia and sucking at my job. And then finally, it got so bad, I was so embarrassed about my performance that I thought, well, I have to try something. So I went along to this four-day course. I liked what I heard. Uh, it made sense to me, it rang true to me. So I signed up for this course, and on the first day of the first course, I was meditating. To be honest, I had no idea what that meant, but I was in a different state of consciousness that I had ever been in before, and I liked it. And then that night, I slept through the night for the first time in 18 months, and I have every night since, and that was about 10 years ago. Then I stopped getting sick, then I stopped getting injured, then I stopped going gray, and I started enjoying my job again, and I thought, why does everybody not do this? So I left Broadway, I went to India, I started what became a three-year training process to teach this, and it is the biggest blessing of my life. My new favorite thing to share to people who say that they're too busy to meditate is, if Oprah has time to meditate, you have time to meditate, right? Like the world's high performers are meditating. The best hedge fund managers, the CEOs, the athletes, the celebrities, they're not meditating because they have copious amounts of extra time. They're doing it because they know it's gonna help them be better at life. They know it's gonna help them perform at the top of their game. But here's why I think people are actually saying they're too busy. People are trying to do a style of meditation that wasn't designed for them. There's a style of meditation that was actually made for us, and yet most of us are trying to do styles that were made for monks. So the beautiful thing about what I teach is that it has nothing to do with clearing your mind. I am wont to say that we don't meditate to get good at meditation, we meditate to get good at life. Because nobody really cares if you're a good meditator, right? No one cares how many or few thoughts you're having when you're sitting quietly in a chair. Everyone cares how good you are at life. How compassionate are you? How kind are you? How creative are you? How innovative are you? And these are all scientifically proven benefits of meditation. So to go back to this difference between what I would call a monastic practice versus meditation for the busy person. And now there's thousands of different styles of meditation, but most of them fall under one of these two categories. The monastic style is a bit more where you're directing your focus. It's a bit more like if you're coming back to the breath or focusing on a candle or even a guided visualization I would put in the category of mindfulness versus what I teach is a bit more of a letting go. It's about giving your body very, very deep rest so that you can be more awake in your waking state, more conscious in your waking state, which is really what improves performance. So what's interesting is I got invited to a neuroscience conference and it was so exciting to get to see actual brain scans, to see scans of the brain. And we can tell now not only that meditation is good for you, but actually how different styles of meditation impact the brain differently. And what was fascinating is that in mindfulness, which is more of a directed focused style of meditation, a smaller part of the brain lights up, but very, very bright. Versus in what I teach, the whole brain lights up, but not as bright, 
which I think is sort of cool because it's basically a physical representation of how these styles are different. Now the interesting thing to note here is that when you light up all of your brain when you're meditating, something strengthens called the corpus callosum. Now the corpus callosum is the thin white strip that actually connects the right and left hemispheres of the brain. And this is a valuable little piece of neuroscience because this corpus callosum is literally the bridge between your critical mind and your creative mind. It is the bridge between that piece of you that likes to review the past and rehearse the future and that thing that is present in the right here, right now. And so we've known for a long time that meditators have thicker corpus callosums than non-meditators, but we weren't able to prove if it was causal or correlated. But now we know that the longer you meditate, the thicker this corpus callosum becomes, which means that next time you're in the middle of a high demand situation, you're gonna have better access to that creative problem solving, to that present moment awareness. Now meditation obviously is not gonna take your demands away, but having this strength and connection between critical mind and creative mind is the thing that allows you to come up with a solution when your boss is coming to you and is like, hey, we need something now. Or even better example is, uh, you know how if you get into a fight with your partner and it starts to get a little heated and you start to get pretty amped and then eventually you either like shut down or start crying or like retreat to the bedroom and then about two hours later once you calm down you start coming up with all these hilarious witty comebacks and you're like, why? Why couldn't I have thought of that in the moment? Well, my hypothesis is, is that the thicker your corpus callosum becomes as a result of meditation, the easier it is for you to come up with all those witty comebacks when it's go time, when it matters. There's thousands of different styles of meditation, but most of them can fall under one of two categories. And one I would say is mindfulness, where we're directing our focus. And then the other I would call meditation, where we're actually accessing different states of consciousness, where the right and left hemispheres of the brain start to function in unison. And in the style that I teach, you're actually giving your body rest that's even deeper than sleep. And this is not an insignificant point because when you give your body the rest that it needs, it knows how to heal itself. And one of the things that it's healing itself from is stress. And as we all know, the less stress we have in our body, the better able we are to perform at the top of our game. Actually, I'm not sure that everyone does know that because I, oftentimes my students will say, because I teach a lot of CEOs, actors, and my artist clients will say to me, Emily, I need my hurdy poos. This is where I create from. And pardon my French, but I think that's total BS. I do not think that stress is the source of our creativity. Now, my CEO clients will say to me, Emily, I need my stress. This is the thing that gives me my competitive edge. This is the thing that keeps me in the game. But you guys, Stress is not doing any of us any favors in the performance department. Stress actually makes you stupid. Why? Because when you're stressed, your brain and body are preparing for an imaginary tiger attack. Your body goes into this involuntary fight or flight stress reaction, and so you don't have your full cognitive power for the task at hand. And so regardless of which style you're using, mindfulness or meditation, they're both gonna get rid of stress in your body and help you perform at the top of your game, just in different ways. What most people are practicing is some variation of mindfulness. And this is why I think people feel like we have to focus, we have to really come back. If you're using the breath as the mind vehicle, you feel like there's a very short lease, you have to come back, come back, come back. And if you start having other thoughts, we see them as distractions. It's not that that style is bad, and it definitely serves a purpose, but there is this other style of meditation that's much more effortless, it's much more innocent, and you're giving your body much deeper rest and to me, if you look forward to something, if it's designed for you, and you start to see the return on investment right away, then meditation becomes something that's not a discipline, but something that actually is like dark chocolate, right? Where you like can't wait to eat it, and then it feels good, and then you perform better afterwards, and then meditation becomes this beautiful self-fulfilling prophecy, instead of something you have to be disciplined because you're doing something that wasn't actually designed for you. I feel like there are three very common attributes of people who start a regular practice, three ways that we can start to tell whether or not we're getting better at life, uh, or three attributes of higher states of consciousness. And they are the ability to hold many things in one awareness, the ability to detect subtlety, and the ability to detect themes. So holding many things in one awareness, I would say that this is valuable no matter what your job is. If you're a stay-at-home mom, you better be able to hold many things in one awareness. If you're running your own company, you better be able to hold many things in one awareness. If you're even walking down the sidewalk in New York City, you better be able to hold many things in one awareness. And so I'm not talking about multitasking, right? This is an important distinction. I'm talking about a simultaneity of consciousness. 
I'm talking about being able to get rid of stress in your body, which has the effect of pulling your lens of your awareness back so you can start to hold many things effortlessly and elegantly in your mind at the same time. And, and the way that meditation helps with this is that you use whatever technique you're using, you de-excite the nervous system. And when you de-excite something, you create order. And when you create order in your body, then the lifetime of accumulated stresses that we all have in our cells can start to leave the body, right? And so less stress you have in your body, less of that involuntary fight or flight stress reaction, more cognitive function you have for the task at hand, for the right now. Here's maybe a better analogy, is that when most of us are stressed, it's like we're on, typing on a computer. If you think about your brain as a computer and you're at work typing an email, and then you decide to take a little break. You open up a little Facebook, a little YouTube, a little Hulu, a little Vine, a little Instagram. And let's just say that you had 10 million open windows on your computer. You're like, hmm, maybe I should get back to work. And you go back to typing that email and the cursor is 20 spaces behind. And you're like, ugh, stupid computer, can't even type an email. Well, the computer's fine. The computer is plenty capable of typing an email, but if you're using all of the battery and computing power to run all these old irrelevant windows, that's what makes the cursor behind. So how this applies to meditation is that what we're doing is that we're going in and we're closing down all of those old irrelevant windows, which gives us more battery power, more computing power for the right now. And this is why meditators perform up to 43% higher on performance tests. So the ability to detect subtlety. Now, I know this might not sound very relevant, but it really is, right? So what does subtlety mean? No two things are the same. No two potential jobs, no two potential relationships, no two potential grapefruits at the grocery store. And life is giving us a constant stream of decisions to make. And I'm gonna make a pretty tall claim right now. The more you meditate, the less likely you are to make a mistake. Now what's a mistake? It's a mistake. We took something to be one thing when it was actually something else. So let's imagine that you have this thing over here and it looks like it's A, B, and C. It dresses like it's A, B, and C. It tells you it's A, B, and C. You really, really want it to be A, B, and C. Maybe you even marry A, B, and C and you're like, oh crap, it's actually D, E, and F. <laughs> now the trick is it was usually always D, E, and F, but if you want something to be A, B, and C bad enough, it's very easy to put on blinders to what is. It's very easy to make ourselves believe something that isn't true if we want it to be true. So there's a beautiful line um, in an ancient body of knowledge called the Vedas. This line is, the truth waits for eyes unclouded by longing. The truth waits for eyes unclouded by longing. And I love this so, so much because we've all been there. We've all wanted the job to be the job so bad that we forgot to read the out clause. We've all wanted the person to be the person so bad that we just ignored the fact that they were mean to their waiter and drinking too much and screaming at their mom. We've all wanted that grapefruit to be the grapefruit so bad that we just grabbed a rotten grapefruit and ran out of the grocery store because we were in a hurry. And so the way that meditation makes you less likely to make a mistake is because it's basically giving you access to your fulfillment, to your bliss, in the only place that they reside, which is inside of you. Now, every spiritual text has been saying this since the beginning of time. What you seek is in you. This is just a concept. And it's beautiful to understand that as an intellectual idea, but it is much, much more powerful to be able to experience that every day, twice a day. And that is what meditation gives you. You're flooding your brain with dopamine and serotonin, which are bliss chemicals, which feel amazing. And it's actually giving you access to this fulfillment internally. And the byproduct of that is that when you come out of the meditation, you wipe some of that longing away from your lens of perception, which allows you to see the subtle differences in things, which in turn makes you less likely to make a mistake. And then the third attribute of higher states of consciousness, or the third way that people tend to get better at life when they start meditating, is the ability to detect themes, right? So what's a theme? It's a pattern. And nature is working in patterns all the time. And the trick is most of us are experts when it comes to other people's patterns. You know, we can all tell like how our brother needs to change his behavior, or our mom, or our roommate, or our boyfriend. You know, it's like if my boyfriend would just go to therapy, then I could be happy. <laughs> but the trick is other people's themes and patterns aren't up to you. The only thing we can ever do is clean our own house. 
And the way that meditation helps with this is that as you go into your body and as you start eradicating the stress from the nervous system, it allows you to pull that lens back so you start to be able to see the whole forest instead of just one stressy tree in front of your face. Um, and this sort of frees you up to put your time and your attention on the creative, constructive themes and patterns in your life and take it away from the destructive themes and patterns. And I would argue that your time and your attention are the two most valuable things you have to give. So you want to take care that you're putting your attention on the themes that you want to grow in your life and not watering the weeds. And we want to take care that we're watering the flowers, not watering the weeds. So the three attributes of higher states of consciousness or the three ways that meditators tend to get better at life is the ability to hold many things in one awareness, a simultaneity of consciousness with effortless and elegance, uh, the ability to detect subtlety, which in turn makes you less likely to make a mistake because you're seeing things for what they actually are. And the third is the ability to detect themes so that you can put your time and attention on the creative themes in your life and take it away from the destructive ones. You can simply use a piece of paper and pen, but I actually want you to write down three people who stress you out the most. I want you to think about three people in your life that you find incredibly stressful. It doesn't mean you don't love them. It doesn't mean you're going to break up with them. Just three people that stress you out. And I don't recommend writing down their name just in case they see this. You can write a code word or something. And, you know, take a moment, think about it. But just three people that stress you out. It's probably the first three that came to mind. And now what I want you to do is next to their code word, I want you to write down the top two attributes about each person. So let's say it's your friend Stephanie, and the top two attributes of Stephanie, she's always late, or she drinks too much, or she never has any money, or just whatever the thing is about Stephanie, whatever stresses you out. And then your second person, and just write down the top two attributes about them. You don't have to think too much about it, probably the first thing that's coming to you is the, is the best thing. And then the third person, just writing down, if you were to describe this person in two words, what two adjectives would you use to describe them? Really good. Now here's my hypothesis, is that the thing that these three people have in common is that in some way they're not self-sufficient. In some way they're a little needy. Either you know, they're always late or they never have any money or they're always sick or they're always complaining or there's just something about them that is not self-sufficient. They're actually asking you to adapt to them now, let's have a little bit of fun, and I want you to think about three people that you would love to invite to a dinner party. If you're throwing a dinner party tonight, what three guests would be your first three calls? Three people who you love being around, who make you feel so present, so happy, so adored. And you can write down these names if you want. <laughs> They'd probably love to sneak up on this journal. And now same exercise, beside each of their name, I want you to write down the top two attributes of this person. So let's say it's your mom, right? And what do you love about your mom? Top two attributes. And the second and third person, if you had to describe them in two words, what would you say? Now my hypothesis here is that what these three people have in common is that they are self-sufficient in some way, that they've found tools that allow them to be present, that allow them to be kind, that allow them to be generous with their time and attention. Uh, you know the people that make you feel like you're the only person in the world that just give you 100% of their energy and attention when they're talking to you? Um, it feels great to be around, and it actually makes you more valuable as a human. And so, now that you've done that exercise and, you, and you've seen the three common elements of our three stressy guests and then the, the uh, through line and the similar attributes of our three inv invited party guests, now I want you to stop and take a moment and just get really honest with yourself and ask yourself, if someone was doing this exercise and my name was on the list, which side of the list would I be on? Would I be on the stressy side or would I be on the self-sufficient side? Now, the reason why I want you to get really honest about this is because if we go back to the original question, the original thing that we spoke about, where most of us think that we're too busy to meditate, I would argue that if this story is still happening in your mind, that this might be actually very selfish. 
right? We think, well, I'm too busy because I need to take care of my kids. I need to take care of my job. I need to take care of my family. But if you are running on empty, and if you don't have a means by which to fill yourself up from the source, then chances are what you're giving to the people around you is stress instead of bliss and fulfillment. And so I would actually argue that meditation is the least selfish thing that we can do. It can feel selfish to take that time for ourselves, but the byproduct of that is more generosity, more creativity, more presence, which actually everyone else wants to be around and makes them feel so much better about themselves. I like to think about meditation as a way to fill up your tank of gas, right? It's like you get to plug into this inexhaustible source of bliss and fulfillment and energy and knowledge. A lot of us, we get very attached to our left brain, to our ego, to our small self, to control, to our illusion of control. But what you do when you meditate is that as you start to take your right brain to the gym, you start to tap into uh, what I like to think of as like a supercomputer, right? The piece of us that has access to more knowledge than just our limited left brain individuality. And actually, when you're giving yourself this deep, deep rest, it's like you're filling yourself up from the source of energy and like you're tapping into the source of knowledge and you're filling yourself up from the source of fulfillment. And once you start meditating, once you start de-exciting the nervous system, and really filling yourself up from the source, you see that there are no limited resources. That the more love you give, the more love you receive. The more generous you are, the more things come to you. The more wisdom you give out, the more wisdom you receive. And that, P.S., is my way to tell if something is really valuable or not. The more you give of it, do you get more of it back? I've had the amazing opportunity to teach 4,200 people to meditate so far, which I'm incredibly grateful for because I feel like the more I teach, the more I learn. And I see these patterns happening again and again. You know, selfishly, why I teach meditation is that every day I get to wake up to emails from people saying, my insomnia is gone, my panic attacks are gone, my anxiety attacks are gone, I was able to get off my meds, my IBS is gone, my skin is better. And so selfishly, this is why I do what I do, is that I get to hear all these stories from people. I had a woman who was blind in her left eye, and she said that during the meditation, she started actually seeing visual in her left eye. I had a man with Parkinson's once who had very pronounced tremors and this, the first meditation his tremors stopped. I've had people uh, who've had insomnia for 10 years be able to sleep on the first night of the meditation course. Um, but what I love more and more is that people are starting to come to meditation really as a productivity tool. Um, that they're not waiting until they're in a mayday situation. They're not waiting until they're in some crisis mode before they adopt a practice. And I think it's largely because so many CEOs and high performers are outing themselves as meditators and because neuroscience is starting to catch up with what these Indian dudes have been saying for 6,000 years. And now we can actually quantify what's happening in the brain and body. Um, so I feel like, you know, even if you don't meditate, you can't write it off as just nonsense anymore. Um, but, but people are coming and they're noticing a big change in their productivity. I also taught a woman named Sadie Lincoln, who's the founder of a company called Bar3. And she is a fitness company and she has 150 different studios around the United States. And she said that meditation has allowed her to be a better boss, a better CEO and a better mother. And so this is what I love hearing the most, is that people are just starting to see it as this way to be the most amazing version of themselves. So what I mean by filling yourself up from the source is that you're basically, every time you meditate, I feel like you are increasing your reservoirs of something that I call adaptation energy. Now, what's adaptation energy? It's basically your ability to handle a change of expectation. It's your ability to handle a demand. So the artist formerly known as stress, I would call high demand. You know, it's really easy to get into this habit of like, oh, my life is so stressful, and my job is so stressful, and my mother-in-law is so stressful. But actually, that puts you in the victim seat. Right? That's as if those things are happening to you, as if you didn't choose to have your job, as if you didn't know that your boyfriend had a mother when you started dating him. Um, and so what meditation does is that it allows you to fill yourself up from the source of adaptation energy so you can handle things more elegantly. So let's put this into a real life example. Let's say that you wake up one morning and you oversleep your alarm by about 10 minutes. Right? Little tiny demand, little tiny change of expectation burns up a little bit of adaptation energy. And then you get uh, on the highway to go to work and your GPS said there's no traffic. You get on the road, it's a parking lot. 
so much traffic. So now you're 30 minutes late and you pop into the, into the coffee shop really quickly uh, because now you're going to be late so you want to really amp it up. And the barista says, uh, listen, we're out of coffee, but here, take this chamomile tea on the house. You're like, I don't want your stupid chamomile tea. Change of expectation. Burns up some adaptation energy. You get to work and your boss says, hey, Emily, can I see you for a second? And uh, you're like, sure, no problem. Uh, listen, thank you for everything. You've been great. We're going to have to let you go. And you're like, uh, this is the first time I've ever been late. Why are you firing me? So you call your boyfriend and you say, babe, uh, I just got let go from my job. Do you think you could maybe get dinner tonight? I'm going to need a little extra support. And he says, uh, about 20 minutes later, he texts you back and says, listen, thank you for everything. I'm going to have to let you go. And you're like, did you just break up with me via text message? Huge change of expectation. Burns up a lot of adaptation energy. So let's say you get home after the worst day of all time and you pour yourself a glass of water or maybe something a little bit stronger and there's a little condensation on the glass and it slips out of your hand and it breaks on the kitchen floor. Now guess what you're going to do? You're going to launch involuntarily into a fight or flight stress reaction. You're going to start crying. You're going to start yelling at the glass. You're going to punch the wall. You're going to run away from this broken glass. Now it's a $2 glass you can replace tomorrow at the store. Doesn't matter how big or small the demand is. If you are out of adaptation energy, then your body's going to launch into that fight or flight stress reaction, whether you want to or not, whether you've read the power of now or not. Now what meditation does for you is that it allows you to fill up from the source. You fill up your reservoirs with adaptation energy. Now does it take away the demands? No but it allows you to adapt to them. It allows you to flow with the inevitable demands that life are going to hand you more elegantly. I had really terrible insomnia before I started meditating. So I love it when people get to cure their insomnia. And so actually when people take the course and if they ever have those body data monitoring bracelets, I always encourage them to track their sleep pre-meditation and post-meditation. And what happens is that most people pre-meditation, the pattern that I see is that their sleep goes light, medium, deep, wake up for 18 minutes, light, medium, deep, wake up for 18 minutes, light, medium, wake up. And that usually takes them about eight or nine hours and they wake up and they still feel exhausted. And then the patterns that I see after meditation is that their sleep goes light, medium, deep for six hours, medium, light, wake up. So they've actually shaved a few hours off of the sleep that they need, but they wake up and they feel refreshed. They feel energized. Now the reason why meditation allows you to A, cure insomnia, and B, sometimes shave um, hours off of the sleep that you need is because if before you have a meditation practice, sleep is the most restful form of rest that most of us have, right? So the body has to use your sleep as a time for stress release. That's actually what insomnia is. You lie down, you give your body a little rest, your brain wants to thank you for that rest, and it thanks you by releasing some stresses, which happens in the form of thoughts. So then you're having all these thoughts, and then it's six in the morning, and you haven't gotten a wink of sleep. Now, when you insert a meditation practice into your life, then your body can actually use the meditation as a time for stress release so it can start to use the sleep as a time for sleep. So this is why meditators report less insomnia and deeper, more refreshing sleep. And I think the more fun that you have when you're learning meditation, the more likely you are to do it. And I think we have this idea about meditation that has to be really serious and really hard and really complicated, um, but actually it can be incredibly simple and incredibly enjoyable. And I would actually argue that the point of life is the expansion of happiness. And so if we're not having fun when we're learning, if we're not having fun when we're doing it, then what's the point? And to me, it's, uh, you know, the more simple something is, actually the more powerful. I think sometimes in the West we confuse uh, simplicity for weakness, but I actually think the more simple something can be, the more powerful it can be. And I think the more fun that you have when you're learning meditation, the more likely you are to do it. Also, selfishly, I just like to use my lifetime of performance training now, but now I get to use it to help others. So I'm so excited about the training. My 10 years of meditation training and all of these different technological tools that are available to us and really created a course that's super digestible, super accessible. And the thing I love most about it is that there's actually two parts to this training. Part one is all about getting good at meditation. This is gonna give you a solid morning practice that you're gonna be able to do without me, without guidance. Eventually you're gonna to be totally self-sufficient to where you just wake up, brush your teeth and meditate. And that's gonna be like priming your brain, priming your body for an amazing day. Right? And then part two of the course is all about uh, using meditation off of the cushion. Right? How do we get good at life? And this is real life applied meditation. So I'm going to give you breathing techniques, visualization techniques, power poses, all for specific life situations. So let's say you are in overwhelm at work 
or let's say you're having insomnia, or if you want to have better sex, or you want to be more productive. Uh, there's lots of ways that we can start to utilize these tools in real life. And each day is going to solve a different problem. And I recommend that you move through the training and really utilize them all in order, but then you can kind of cherry pick your favorite. And because of the way the app works, you don't have to go home and log into your computer. You're just going to have me on your phone. So if you get into one of these real life situations, you can just hit play and you can excuse yourself, go to the bathroom or listen to it on the bus, on a plane, um, in the parking lot before you have a meeting and really go into each real life situation charged up and ready to rock. So day one through 17 of this course is part one. And this is all about getting good at meditation. This is all about giving you self-sufficient tools so that you're gonna have a morning practice that you look forward to. So that you just wake up, brush your teeth and meditate. And eventually once you move through that training, you're gonna have this practice to take with you for life. And then day 18 through 33 is part two of the course. And this is all about getting better at life. This is about taking these tools that we've learned and starting to apply them to real life situations. So anything from wanting better sleep to better sex to more productivity to being more kind or even finding your purpose or being more conscious about what you consume or having tools to handle overwhelm at work or handling travel better. This is everything that we're gonna be handling in part two. And the other thing that's really great about this is that we actually teach people how to chart their success because most people are judging their meditations based on misinformation and they're judging the meditation based on how many or few thoughts they're having so actually on day one we walk you through a whole exercise where you assess different areas of your life and you're gonna do that again on day 33 so you actually will have the proof in your own life in your own performance in your own experience and some of the days are even less than 20 minutes some days it's five minutes ten minutes I feel like most people fall into one of two camps they either hate the word meditation they don't even want to try it because they're allergic to it and they think it means incense and caftans and finger symbols or there's the other camp of people that feel like they're already an expert and they already know it and they've already tried all the things or they've tried it and they've hated it that's actually three camps but just go with it. um so this is why i really love this course and one of the things you learn in this is called the m word technique and i like the word the m word because it takes the word meditation just out of it so if you're scared of that word meditation then fine this is going to allow you to go into this with beginner's mind allow you to go into this with an attitude of curiosity and if you are already an expert if you have a different style of meditation, again, I invite you to go into this with beginner's mind and allowing this practice to be what it is for you. Some of the things might be basic, but having been a former dancer, I find that there's so much power in going back to the basics. Going back to the fundamentals makes your performance so much better. One of the things I love about this training is that we're all going to be moving through it together and we're going to have ways to interact so I can answer your questions in real time and really provide as much support as possible. So we actually created a special guided meditation for travel, uh, for kids, and for breakups, because we find that these are things that are often very taxing and stressful for people. And I'm really excited about this because I feel like it's the first of its kind. The first, most meditation courses either give you a practice to do on your own or it's guided visualizations for a certain part of life. And this course actually gives you both. I think you get the best of both worlds and I'm so excited about it. So I'm really excited to share these tools with you. They're some of my favorite. And we're gonna start by using the breath to just come in, settle in, de-excite the nervous system. Then we'll move through a five sensory experience and into something I call the love bomb, which is something you learn in part one of the course. And then at the end, I'm gonna actually walk you through a pep talk. And you can use this in preparation for any important activity that you have coming up, anything where you really wanna perform at the top of your game. Now I chose these two elements to lead you through because they really are illustrative of how the course works. The first half of the course is all about allowing you to be good at meditation and the second half is all about getting good at life. So to begin, I'd love for you to have a seat with your back supported and your head free. So just anywhere you feel comfortable, you could be on a couch, on a chair, just back supported, head free. 
and go ahead and close the eyes. And we'll start with something I call 2x breath. So we're simply inhaling through the nose for two and exhaling through the mouth for four. Really good, so just settling into the chair, inhaling through the nose for two and exhaling through your mouth for four. We'll do this a few times, inhaling for two and exhaling for four, letting these be big and delicious inhales and exhales, noticing that your body softens as you exhale. And finally, biggest inhale you've taken all day. And as you exhale, just allowing your body to melt and soften into the chair, into the couch, softening your face, softening your jaw. Giving yourself full permission to be right here, right now. And now from this place, I'm gonna walk you through something I call come to your senses. We're gonna walk through all five senses. So begin by gently bringing your awareness to your sense of hearing. What's the most prevalent sound you can detect right now? It might simply be the sound of my voice, or maybe there's a fan on in the room where you are. And we're not judging anything, we're not trying to push anything away. We're actually pulling the lens of our awareness back and including all of our senses and really including all of the sounds in your awareness right now. I'm listening for the pronounced and the subtle. Really good. And on your next breath, gently bringing your awareness to your sense of touch. So what's the most prevalent tactile sensation happening for you right now? For most of us, it'll be our bums in the chair, or maybe your feet on the ground, or maybe your heart is racing, or you have a headache. Again, we're not judging anything. We're not trying to change it. We're just gently waking up our sense of touch. Maybe even imagining that all the hairs on your arm are like little antenna, becoming very attuned to the subtle, tactile sensations. Can you even feel the breath as it comes in and out of the nose? Really good, and keeping the eyes closed, gently bring your awareness to your sense of sight. So even with the eyes closed, there's still some sort of a sight happening, and it might simply be blackness, or maybe you look beyond the blackness and maybe you can see colors in your mind's eye, or light streaming through your eyelids. Just really giving yourself permission to see whatever it is that you're seeing. Beautiful, and on your next breath, gently bringing your awareness to your sense of taste. What's the most prevalent taste happening for you right now? Is your mouth acidic or dry? Really good, and on the next breath, taking a big delicious inhale and really smell what you're smelling. What's the most prevalent smell you can detect right now? Beautiful, and now that you've woken up all five of your senses, we're gonna to start to stack them on top of each other and play with the simultaneity of consciousness. So noticing, can you hear what you're hearing, feel what you're feeling, see what you're seeing, taste what you're tasting, and smell what you're smelling all at the same time? Giving yourself permission to be so deliciously human, so present in your body. And one final time, waking up your sense of hearing, your sense of touch, your sense of sight, your sense of taste, and your sense of smell. Beautiful. And from this space of expanded awareness and intense presence, I want you to imagine someone that you love very much I want you to imagine someone that you love very much sitting about two feet in front of you. Really see their face, see their hair. What are they wearing? Are they happy, are they sad? And ideally this is someone that you love very much and if you can't think of a human that you love, maybe think of your dog or your cat or even your favorite dish. <laughs> Just something that inspires the feeling of love inside of you. 
And on your next inhale, I want you to breathe into that sensation of love in your body. And I want you to imagine supercharging every single cell in your body with the sensation of love. Really good. And as you exhale, I want you to imagine sending that out to this person that you love very much, almost blasting them with love so that you're supercharging every cell in their body with this feeling of love. Love really is the most powerful antidote to fear. And on your next breath, I want you to breathe in this sensation of love into your body, supercharging every cell in your body with this sensation. And as you exhale, I want you to imagine sending that out to the entire room. Just filling the room that you're in with this beautiful wave and this current of love. Some people like to imagine this as a white light or a golden light, but whatever feels charming to you. Really good. And on your next inhale, breathing in this sensation, supercharging your own body with love. And as you exhale, imagine sending this out to the entire city, every person, place, and thing in the city where you live, all your friends, all your enemies, your boss, your coworkers, just blasting them with love. And if you feel like you're losing that sensation, simply come back to the person, the person who you love, your significant other, your family member, your baby, your dog, and just see them across from you. And notice how that changes you. Notice how that softens your face. Notice how that changes your heart. And breathing in that sensation into your body, supercharging yourself with this, and then sending that out to the entire planet Earth. Just blasting the whole planet with as much love as you can possibly muster. Really good, and on your next breath, letting this be a delicious inhale, supercharging every single cell in your body, and as you exhale, imagine sending this love out into the entire universe, just blasting the whole universe with as much love as you can possibly create. And know that as you're sending this sensation out, it's absolutely coming back to you, because there really is only one thing and we're all it. So just imagine sending this love out to as far as your mind can conceive, beyond the solar system, beyond the galaxy, beyond the clusters of galaxies, and out into the entire universe, to the entirety of all that is. And reminding yourself that you actually are a part of the universe, and the universe is a part of you. Universe, one song. And allowing yourself to surrender into the sense of connectedness, and support, almost imagining that you're one wave on a giant ocean of consciousness. You are one wave on this giant ocean of energy. And that just for a moment, as you send this love out to the whole universe, you remind yourself that you're one part of a greater whole. And allow yourself to receive all of that love that's coming back to you from the universe and letting that fill you up from the source, letting that supercharge your body so that you can take that with you into your life, into your job, into your family. Really good. And now from this place of connectedness and having supercharged your whole body with the sensation of love, I want you to imagine that you're going into some situation that's important to you. We're gonna to start to take this meditation off the mat and into life. Because again, we meditate to get good at life, not to get good at meditation. So imagine that you're just about to walk on stage, or you're just about to give a presentation to your board, or you're about to propose to someone, or you wanna be more present for your kids. Just anything that is important to you that you wanna show up at the top of your game. And now imagine that you're right before that. You're in the wings, you're about to open the door. And I'm gonna give you a little pep talk. So just noticing whatever feelings come up. For most of us, it's a little bit of anxiety or nervousness or what if or speculation. And you can simply come back to that sensation of love or come back to the breath and just receive the words that I'm going to give you. Just allow yourself to receive them as true. Because here's what I know for sure. You are meant for greatness. 
the situation is important to you and you might be feeling some nervousness or anxiety because you care a lot about what you do. You want to show up as the most amazing version of you. So give yourself full permission to feel everything that you're feeling. If you're nervous, be nervous. If you're sad, be sad. If your heart is racing, let it race. We don't want to push against the feelings because they'll only push back harder. So we want to take a moment to accept what is. Let it talk to you. And usually if we simply listen to the body, it will say whatever it needs to say and then that sensation will dissipate. Now, my guess is that this situation, this opportunity that you care about wouldn't have even shown up if you hadn't been moving through a lifetime of work and dedication and creativity. So take a moment to acknowledge your success. Take a moment to celebrate all of your successes, every win that you've had that's brought you to this situation that you care so much about. We can't build on top of success we don't acknowledge. So just taking a moment to celebrate all of your successes that have led to this big opportunity. And I want you to imagine that you have a magic wand and you could wave it and this situation could go any way that you want. The proposal, she says yes. The board says yes. You're confident, you're easy. You're funny, you're charming. And I want you to just play this movie in your mind of whatever the situation is, really play it out, but play it out best case scenario. They laugh at your jokes, you look amazing, the deal closes. And just letting whatever comes up in your imagination, there's no right or wrong way to do this, you're just letting your imagination have a little bit of fun. And now imagine that you're leaving the room, you're leaving the stage, you're putting your kid to bed, and just noticing the feeling that's happening inside of you when you feel very proud of and excited of what you brought to the table. When you feel like you've done your best, when you've done everything that you can so that you can really let it go, so that you can surrender to nature. The peace that comes with that, the serenity that comes with that. And taking a moment to give yourself a big internal high five, both for taking the time to walk through this situation mentally and for sticking with us and for investing in yourself, taking a moment to acknowledge the success of you investing this time in this practice right here, right now. And taking a big delicious inhale, breathing some life into your hands, into your feet and exhaling, letting go of anything that isn't serving you. One more time, big delicious inhale, breathing some life into your body, bringing your awareness into the room. And in your own time, whenever you're ready, you can start to slowly, gently open the eyes. Bye, friends.